Welcome to Digital Asset Report, powered by Fintech TV. I'm your host, Kavita Gupta. In the last couple of weeks, we have covered a lot of DeFi, NFTs, uh, the stories about how different auction products are going to be in the space, to regulation, infrastructure bill. Um, today, I'm going a little bit in the history because uh, today we have a guest who got into the space super early, had their company doing a token sale in 2017, the complete high time of doing ICOs, but the company survived and actually created some of the top products even for today uh, and, con and had the vision to go back all the way in 16 and 17 to have a white paper on a true decentralized exchange and a predictive platform at that. Stefan George, co-founder and CEO of Gnosis. Hi Stefan, how are you doing? Hey Kavita, thanks for having me. Doing great, how are you? Good, good. So Stefan, I uh, there's so many questions I want to ask, but let's start from very beginning. Uh, how did your journey into blockchain and crypto started? Oh yeah, that's a very long time ago. Actually 2013, at a time when there was only Bitcoin, and I think Bitcoin yeah. was trading at $30. And me and uh, my friend, co-founder Martin, um, we stumbled upon the Bitcoin white paper. And yeah, Martin was really yeah, very convinced about Bitcoin. I thought it's sort of a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> Uh, Martin is the real also, visionary at Gnosis. Can I underline that? <laughs> oh, 100%. And uh, nonetheless, um, I was still keen enough to also start building software around Bitcoin. So at that time, we started to write uh, software for Bitcoin and um, also sort of like a prediction market exchange based on Bitcoin. And uh, then we realized uh, that Ethereum was happening in 2014. And we also saw the potential for building what we previously built on Bitcoin, much more decentralized on Ethereum. And uh, yeah, then end of 2014, uh, we met Joseph Lubin from Consensus and he convinced us to, to join Consensus and uh, build this new platform on Ethereum as part of Consensus. And um, yeah, that's how we started. Uh, the project was called Gnosis. And then as you mentioned in 2017, we were able to spin off, um, did our own ICO, raised capital, and uh, this allowed us then to, to grow to the company that we are today. And uh, also, yeah, kind of do a lot of different things right now, and not yeah. only prediction markets. And yeah, that's quite exciting. It's been a fascinating journey. So back in 2015, when the whole Ethereum launch was happening, were you one of those people who got it for two or three cents? <laughs> Uh, well, you we were, so I did not participate in the token sale. Oh my God. Um, but I was, of course, like at, at the point when Ethereum was finally tradable, it stayed below a dollar for quite some time. Uh, and I remember, and at that time, of course, well, we were purchasing Ethereum because only, it would be kind of a pity to, to work full time on something and then not participate in the upside if it actually works. So it was an obvious choice to do this. Yeah. And, um, but I also remember DEFCON 1 in London, where uh, I kind of expected this would have a bigger impact on the Ethereum price, uh, because finally you could see uh, what's happening on Ethereum. Um, but this actually also did not have a big impact. So I think only uh, beginning of 2016 is when finally the first Ethereum rally really started. And um, yeah, everyone who, of course, knew about Ethereum earlier got lucky. <laughs> um, yeah. So Stefan, as as your journey started by thinking that Bitcoin is actually a Ponzi scheme to all the way we come to 16 and 17, um, you wrote you guys wrote a white paper and started thinking about building a prediction market on Ethereum when scalability solutions didn't exist, the gas price was high. Um, how Where was the conviction coming from and how did you see that unfolding over time? Yeah, actually, uh, when we started, gas prices were not a concern because there was hardly any user and the gas prices were low. Ethereum had like very little value. So you could really do transactions for like cents, uh, whatever you wanted to do. And I think that's also how the first software projects came about. Like there were not any time was spent on trying to make gas efficient. Um, like the multi-signature wallet that we wrote at the time was from a gas efficiency perspective, terrible. <laughs> like no one would ever write like this uh, today. 
Uh, at that time, it didn't matter because gas prices were super low and no one was, this was never really a concern. Um, and, uh, but obviously we also saw that there's a limit to how much Ethereum could scale at that time. Yeah. However, we also expected that scalability solutions would have been further along at today's time. Uh, so obviously sharding was being talked about already in 2016, 2015. Uh, still today, we don't have it. And I feel uh, we have seen innovation taking place uh, elsewhere to solve scalability, especially uh, CK snarks. CK snarks are super interesting, uh, something that was not foreseeable at the time. And uh, yeah, even today, I'm not really concerned about scalability uh, simply because I see that, um, yeah, there's still a lot of innovation happening. Um, and I think this will be solved. It's only a technical issue. Um, and there are enough smart people in the space to, to solve it for us. True. Uh, I'm more concerned about regulation uh, being actually a much bigger hurdle to overcome for us. Um, but in terms of technical challenges, I think we will all solve them. And until they are solved, we have other great solutions like side chains um, that we can apply to, to kind of have activities across different chains and depending on what the security concerns are for those we can operate on a few mainnet or we can operate on a side chain uh, like polygon um does proof of stake and ethereum movement towards it helps a platform like yours so proof of stake in itself will not be necessarily a big game changer for for gnosis um i think it's still a great uh, security improvement it's not really yet a scalability improvement. Um, this only comes with sharding. So the move to proof of stake will not have a, like a big impact on scalability. Uh, however, I think in terms of security assumptions, it's uh, a much better uh, approach. And uh, that's why we think it should really happen sooner than later. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of scalability, we are looking more into other solutions. Like you mentioned side chains, we are uh, also heavily working on uh, like trying to to improve XDAI, uh, another side chain to Ethereum. And um, yeah, I'm really amazed by how much innovation is happening also on layer two. Uh, we recently saw this merge of Hermes network um, with another side chain and Hermes has done really great research uh, for ZK uh, EVM. So a way to yeah, make computation much more succinct, provable, um, but still allowing flexibility of an Ethereum virtual machine. And all of those uh, are really, I think, very promising. And that's why scalability is not really a big concern, even though, of course, today on Ethereum, we have to realize that gas fees are so high that many use cases are priced out. And only, yeah, only like high value DeFi transactions are actually really viable today on Ethereum. Makes sense. Uh, Stefan, for people who may not know the extent of what Gnosis has become today, not just a prediction market, but also a decentralized exchange, and you have a Gnosis DAO, and there's much more happening. Uh, give us an overview of what Gnosis is today. Right. As I said, like we started with prediction markets, but actually today our focus is very different. So we pivoted a couple of times. Uh, actually, like one project that was kind of a side effect from our own uh, token sale at the time is our smart contract based multi signature wallet, um, which came the default for, for projects to manage uh, their funds because it was kind of the only one available that was considered secure enough. And uh, we continued developing it and then turned into what's no, now known as you know, the safe, um, which is at this point the default smart contract wallet for, yeah, for any larger amounts that have to be secured by teams. And every organization today that is starting on Ethereum can be DeFi projects, can be funds, can be any kind of organization. Most of them actually have and also safe to begin with because a multi-signature is kind of the, a very simple concept to ensure that uh, there's not a single point of failure, one person controlling the system. And um, yeah, now we are extending this platform uh, to allow also other use cases, we extended it also on an app level, we kind of integrated our own app store to make it really easy for others to participate in DeFi. And yeah, it's a growing ecosystem at this point, over $50 billion <laughs> worth of tokens and Ether are controlled in those sales. And yeah, so it has become really important cornerstone of the DeFi ecosystem. And um, yeah, and then we have 
been working a lot on decentralized exchanges. Um, we have been doing a lot of research early on also on automated market maker. Uh, one of our engineers came up with the constant product formula, which is the one also used by Uniswap and, and other market makers. And um, yeah, and then recently uh, we also released a new exchange, which is called CowSwap. Oh. And CowSwap is a decentralized exchange I want to underline this. This is C O W, right? Cow swap. Yeah, C O W. Um, Why? <laughs> Why that name? Right. So the cow cow stands for coincidence of wants, and this is a term that reflects if there are two parties who want to trade, mm -hmm. um, there can be the occasion that both parties want to trade uh, in the opposite direction. Let's say I want to buy ether for die, and you want to sell ether for die. Mm -hmm then this is what is called a coincidence of want if our price is matching as well, because then we can directly trade with each other without even having to go through any uh, other liquidity sources. And that's the most efficient way of trading. And that's something that CowSwap allows to do. So CowSwap allows, uh, it's a batch auction mechanism, which means that we are collecting uh, user orders over a period of time, um, a batch, and then we are calculating how the different user orders can be matched. And the most efficient way is having a cow where we can directly match users because then you don't have to pay any fee to any on-chain liquidity provider. Um, but in case there is no cow, uh, then we can also leverage all liquidity that is on Ethereum today. And so we can guarantee when you trade on CowSwap that you either get, get the best deal, which is available on-chain, or you get even a better deal uh, by trading directly with another partner. And um, that's why CowSwap became so successful because it's, it allows users to have the same user experience as they have today on Ethereum when trading on Uniswap uh, or very similar. And at the same time, having the advantage of uh, getting the best price possible. And uh, the great thing is also that CowSwap uh, has a positive network effect. Mm -hmm. So obviously the more people are trading on CowSwap, the more likely we have cows and the more likely users will get a better price. And uh, that's different to every other decentralized exchange on Ethereum today because there, there is no positive network effect. If there are more people trading, there's no benefit for the single trader. Um, and that's a big difference. And there's one more change to, to CowSwap, which is great. So uh, recently the topic of MEV became very important on Ethereum. And this reflects to the ability of a miner to reorder transactions and insert transactions to their liking and by doing so extract value from users. And one very simple uh, like way they can do this is something called a sandwich attack. Uh, if a user wants to do a trade, they define a slippage, meaning they are willing to, uh, to also accept trades which are not exactly their price but a slightly worse price. And a miner can now decide to just purchase uh, the token the user wants to buy before the user driving the price up then settling the user trade at this maximum uh, willingness to pay and then selling the asset immediately after and by doing so, uh, making a profit. So Stefan, and, yeah. Yeah, so there's so much happening on the platform, but I want to go back to the word which you said that regulation is probably more of an issue than the technology in the system, right? Much more on the digital asset report when we come back. Welcome to FinTech TV, home of Exponential Voices, a global media platform for digital assets and sustainable investing. My name is Kavita Gupta. And I'm Vince Molinari, and we are so pleased to be back at the New York Stock Exchange. Headquartered in New York, where we are constructing a state-of-the-art broadcast studio, along with our studio stock exchange partners at the NYSE, NASDAQ, and LSEG, among others plus correspondents and contributors all over the globe. We reach 850 million households globally with a unique blend of online viewership and traditional TV networks. Our signature shows the Digital Asset Report, focused on the global ecosystem of blockchain, digital assets, financial tech evolution, and legislation and regulations surrounding the sector. I, 
I guess my question to you then is, uh, A, are you a believer that Bitcoin is the, I don't want to call it the holy grail? The way I think of Bitcoin is a global currency. Individual countries will continue to have their stable coins. And The Impact, a show focused on credible social entrepreneurs, impact investors, family offices, and the grassroots warriors amplifying the needs and progress of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Plus, ongoing special series. Pat Mitchell, Dangerous Women Leading Onward. Roy Wood Jr., Faces of Race. SSE TV, UN Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. Price of Climate. Unique content on a global media platform. This is FinTech TV. Before we go into the regulation, I also want to bring in Anush Bhaseen, uh, our India contributor for Fintech TV. Uh, hi Anush, how are you doing? Hey Kavita, I'm well, how are you? Good, thank you. I just feel like that we need to convert this into more like a Wikipedia. This is just not about Gnosis, but this is about what's really happening in the space. Um, I wanted to touch base on regulation though, but Anush, before I do that, what would be your question with respect to India for him? Sure, Stefan, it's a pleasure to meet you and uh, we're, we're very happy to have you on the show. Um, I, I'd like to touch upon Gnosis Safe a, a bit more as Indians are just becoming familiarized with cryptocurrencies, their understanding about not your keys, not your crypto, and they're planning to move it off of exchanges onto say private wallets, but that's all they're aware of. They don't know about multi-sec wallets such as Gnosis. So how do you feel this transition can be made easier? And also can we educate people about how something like Gnosis Safe is so much better and more secure than hardware wallets like uh, Ledger or Trezor? Right. Yeah, I think there uh, still needs to be a lot of education for users to really understand uh, what the concept of a private key is and how how wallets work. Um, usually, users only learn the hard way when an exchange gets hacked, uh, and then they realize they don't that they're not in control of their funds. Um, I think one big driver to this can also be simply incentives. So that's what we saw in the last uh, six months or so, or seven, eight months, that uh, activity on DeFi really was driving a lot of users from centralized exchanges onto decentralized platforms because they saw a lot of opportunity there. It was less about uh, being in control of your funds. Um, and I think many still consider exchanges like FTX maybe being a better custodian than themselves, um, but yeah, just the fact that there was such a big opportunity on in DeFi uh, on Ethereum mainnet, but also by smart chain, made many users um, realize uh, or like do finally the step to set up their own wallet, move funds from a centralized exchange, and understand how DeFi applications actually work. And I think that was a great first step, independent of what the uh, original motivation was. And uh, I hope that they will stay in DeFi and that they're not going to go back to deposit their funds back into a centralized exchange afterwards. Uh, but I think it's quite likely because uh, I also think that wallets have been improving a lot in terms of usability. And it's actually, yeah, it's not a terrible UX anymore to, to make sure that you keep your own wallet and uh, make sure that you are uh, in control of your own funds. And uh, I think Nosa Safe can also play an important role in this, obviously. Uh, right now, the focus of the safe is more uh, institutions, and organizations in general, uh, not so much uh, individuals, even though we have prominent individual users like Vitalik and all of ESA into a safe. Um, but uh, I think the, the setup and the user interface right now is not specifically uh, targeted for individual users. However, if you have a lot of money, uh, a lot of crypto, then you should still consider it anyways, because it's the most secure way to yeah, to uh, to store your funds uh, and to simply explain multi-signature wallets, uh, you can think of it as a shared bank account where you require multiple confirmations to actually do transaction. 
And usually this will be an organization where you have multiple people that have to confirm on chain in the safe to, for example, transfer funds to another account. Uh, but if you are the owner, if this is an individual use case, then you can think of it more like two-factor authentication, um, where you have different devices, different keys, which have to sign off on certain transactions before you can actually uh, execute them. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stefan. Stefan, one question in one line. If there is one regulation, you absolutely want government either not to have it or have it. What would be that one regulation in one line? Um, <laughs> what's the most important one for me? Uh, okay, KYC wallets. That would be a terrible idea, in my opinion. Um, that would uh, really prevent a lot of innovation and uh, kind of defeat the purpose for me for having blockchain in the first place. Very interesting. I think we need another episode just to go into KYC and AML. Uh, but Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for sharing on Gnosis and I'm pretty sure all the new products which are about to be launched on Gnosis are going to change the way people work in this space. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kavita. Welcome to Fintech TV, a global media platform for digital assets and sustainable investing. My name is Kavita Gupta. And I'm Vince Molinari, and we are so pleased to be back at the New York Stock Exchange. Our signature shows the Digital Asset Report, focused on the global ecosystem of blockchain, digital assets, financial tech evolution, and the impact. A show focused on credible social entrepreneurs, impact investors, we reach 850 million households globally. This is FinTech TV. Hi, I'm Brahim Al Husseini. And I'm Alexandria Villasenor. And this is The Price of Climate, powered by FinTech TV. We live in a closed sphere. It has a very delicate life support system that we've disrupted because of modern human civilization. I think it's really important how this show is bringing together all sectors of our society, which I think is very important when talking about climate change. The warmer the planet gets, and the more we disrupt the planet, and more that people are going to pay the price. You can't hurt the planet unless you first hurt people. And we want innovators in all these four uh, different tracks to come up with solutions. How can we sustain our natural resources as I could see that we were overusing them? This is going to be a very you know, interesting conversation where we just cover multiple different areas of the climate crisis. We can bring activism, the business community, government, and all stakeholders together to solve this problem. First off, of course it's horrible what is happening to our planet and a lot of young people are seeing what's happening and it's really upsetting. When we are fighting for uh, climate action and climate justice, we're not just fighting for future generations, we are also fighting for every living species on this planet.